And so we've been talking to you about the changes to the COVID testing system. Let's get it straight, shall we? Let's talk to the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps. Good morning, Grant Shapps. Happy New Year. Morning. Um, thank Thanks you very so much for joining us on Breakfast. So a lot of us are trying to get our heads around these changes um, that have come into play. Shall we start with how we test and the changes to when we need to um, uh, go for a PCR test? Right. Well, well first of all, um, well, should we start right at the beginning? Before you left the country that you were coming from to come here, you would have been required a pre-departure test uh, as of tomorrow. That is going, so you don't need to test before you come here. When you get here, you would have required um, to quarantine yourself until you had the results of a day two PCR test. Again, on Sunday, that goes, uh, you'll no longer require a PCR test. You won't need to quarantine either. That would be replaced by a simple lateral flow test that you uh, purchase as part of your package from a private provider. And okay. that is it. So there'd just be a single lateral flow test. Why the change? Well, we always brought in the measures temporarily. When we um, saw Omicron um, start in, in, in South Africa, uh, we introduced the red list. We introduced this testing, uh, quite uh, strong testing uh, procedure. Uh, and in that time, we've managed to get 30 million jams into people's uh, arms. So it, it, it's done its part. But since Omicron is, is widespread and, and worldwide now, Omicron testing for travellers just outlived its usefulness. And that's why we've removed it now. OK, that's what that's when it comes to Omicron. Are you aware or, or which um, potential variants of, con of concern have you been told about? Uh, well, the, the, the health uh, experts track it all the time, of course, and, uh, and, uh, but we know that Omicron right now is the one no, no, that sorry, globally is swamping other, everything else. Not Omicron, other variants of concern, potential variants of concern, because that was the whole reason the PCR testing was brought in and lauded, because it can be then used to um, be genome sequenced and to find the other variants. We're not immune to new variants. So I'm just asking, what potential variants of concern have you been told about? Yeah, I mean, there are, at any one time, just to explain, because there are thousands of mutations that take place in, in coronavirus and any other uh, mm. virus, in fact. Uh, and so experts are, are tracking them all. I don't have the names of all of them to, to have, but they're tracking them all, all the time and they bring them to us uh, when they have uh, more significant concerns. Right now in the world, Omicron is the one which, even where others bubble up, uh, swamps them. So it's the one which is a primary concern. And you're right about PCR testing. But remember, we're not doing away with PCR testing. In fact, we've massively expanded our PCR testing ability and our testing ability. Do you know, on Tuesday this week, uh, we tested over two million separate tests. So we're doing a lot of testing. Uh, and even with these changes, if you get a positive Sorry, lateral um, flow I test, then it must be pcr I know we're doing lots of testing, but just when it comes to travelling, we will be doing fewer PCR tests. Yes, but if you get a positive lateral flow test, then you must PCR test it. And you can do that part of it, the PCR, on the NHS so it can be sequenced as well. So that part still stays in place. And because we're doing so much PCR testing and, and testing generally in the country itself, we have a, a much higher level of, of uh, sequencing, genome sequencing, the ability to see whether there are mutations that actually than any other country in, in the world. So we're tracking it very carefully, regardless of whether it starts here or somewhere else. OK, I just want to make sure that I'm, I, we're being clear, because I started the interview saying we will be clear, because I do think it can be confusing. Let's put aside what we're doing in the UK in general testing in one, uh, for one moment, because mm. we'll come to that. Just when it comes to travel, are you confident by reducing the number of PCR tests that are needed now when we travel, um, that you, we are going to be as able to identify new variants of concern, which you say you don't have a number or you, ha you, you know, you, there are, you haven't been um, flagged any at the moment. Have, are you well, there are thousands of mutations. Yeah, mutations, mutations place, but so. variants of concern emerge, don't they? And then your That's transport right. secretary would be told about them. Um, if you're not PCR testing as much, how would we be able to know if those variants of concern are coming here? Yeah, so there's a there's a playoff. And actually, if you take a lateral flow test and you get your result immediately, rather than waiting a day or, or sometimes more, uh, then you can act faster on it. And, and the action, of course, is immediately to then have a PCR test. So in some senses, we'll get to knowing 
that result quicker. People won't necessarily be waiting for the second day. Uh, they'll get their result of that lateral flow straight away. So we'll still keep very, very close tags on this. And I would say to you, I think we have to get away from the idea that somehow within the UK, we're all safe, you know, there's somehow sort of a safe haven, but the rest of the world is dangerous out there. That's not the case. Omicron is everywhere. We have very large numbers of Omicron cases here. There are very large numbers of cases elsewhere. We are an international country. People need to be able to travel. We need to be able to travel to sometimes see family or or, or do business and, and, and keep the economy um, going. So, you know, I think it's absolutely right that having introduced these temporary measures, but now seeing that Omicron is everywhere, Omicron testing has really outlived its usefulness. And therefore, we don't keep uh, things in place when there's no longer any point to having them there. So if a new variant of concern comes, uh, is you're made aware of this, government's made aware of this, the old system will come back into place. Yes, indeed. And actually with Omicron, remember, we acted before it was even officially classed as a uh, as a variant of concern. Uh, we did that before the WHO got there. We still have the red list, though no countries on it right now. But we have that facility on standby. Of course, we will always act. But I think also we need to move to a position where living with Omicron means that we are able to still travel, that we're still able to do business, visit family and all of those things, go on holiday, all of those things, uh, and recognise that, you know, uh, coronavirus has already been with us for nearly two years, thankfully, due to things like uh, vaccines and things like the yeah. antivirals, of which we've got more in this uh, country purchased here uh, than any other place. Uh, because of those things, we are able to sort of reopen and, and get on with life as well. So moving to the domestic testing rules, we've, kind of, we've talked about travel, domestic testing rules, which you've alluded to. Um, if you don't have any COVID symptoms, um, and you test, you take a lateral flow test, which many of us are doing, you know, as we come to work, as we go to outdoor events, et cetera, um, or events outside um, in public. If you test positive, you now, and then you have no symptoms, you now no longer have to take a PCR test. You just isolate there and then without needing a PCR result. What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, that's right. Well, look, we, we want to make sure that we've always got the testing facilities available, particularly for frontline staff and people like the critical workers in, in transport or in the health service, for example. So we, we're doing a bit of prioritisation uh, on that. Um, a very good example of where this would work actually happened in my household over Christmas as my older son uh, felt absolutely fine. But because we were seeing my, uh, my, my parents, his grandparents, uh, he took a lateral flow test, found that he was positive, uh, ended up um, self-isolating for 10 days as a result. The difference now would be he went for a confirmatory PCR test. He no longer needs to go and do that. And that's because these lateral flow tests have what is called the specificity uh, of 99.97%. That means that only three in 10,000 tests would show a false positive. So we're, we're so we're so confident in the lateral uh, flow test being accurate for a positive uh, that we're saying we don't need to use the resource to PCR it afterwards if somebody is asymptomatic, they don't have any symptoms. Um, a couple of other areas I'd like to touch with you, touch upon with you today, um, Grant Shapps. Um, you'll be well aware that yesterday a court found the Colston Four, these are four people accused of criminal da damage by um, pulling down the Colston statue in Bristol, not guilty of criminal damage. And uh, the Conservative government, the Home Secretary Priti Patel, um, last year was pushing for stronger sentencing for those who are found guilty of criminal damage, um, 10 years imprisonment. Um, your view on what this ruling means, yesterday's mm. ruling would mean, for that, considering what actually would be considered criminal damage now? Well, well look, the first thing I'd say is I, I don't want to sort of comment on an individual case and the jury's decision and, and what have you. We have an independent judiciary and, and, and jury system for that, for that reason. But I would also say that we can't have a situation in this country where it's acceptable for people to go around and destroy uh, property, public property or, or, or anything else. A peaceful protest is absolutely the right way to go. If you want to get rid of a, a statue, you know, that's why we have democracy. You can you can you can petition, you can stand for election, you can get these things uh, removed. Um, so we do have a, a clause in in the police crime and sentencing uh, bill. Uh, which will uh, perhaps close a, a potential loophole uh, and mean that, you know, you can't just go right around uh, cause vandalism, uh, you know, destroy, uh, you know, the public realm, as it were, 
uh, and, uh, and 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 then you know essentially uh, not be uh, prosecuted because that's the basic rule of law in place. Uh, and I think that that needs to apply. If people want to remove statues. There's a perfectly legitimate way to go about uh, doing that, and, uh, and 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 that's why we live in a democracy, frankly. Um, yesterday there was a cabinet meeting that you attended. Is that correct? Yes. OK, um, and it is reported on the front page of the Daily Telegraph today that the leader of the Commons, J uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, has called for the increase in national insurance to be abandoned. Um, and it is also reported that Mr um, Sunak, the Chancellor, has rejected that call. Can you confirm that, please? Uh, no, because I absolutely never get into commenting on what's said and, and discussed at cabinet meetings. That that, that you know they're, they're they're done in cabinet, and then we have a form of what's called collective responsibility, where we uh, all um, take the agreement and 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 uh, make sure that as a government uh, we we implement that. And in this particular case, uh, you know, it is it is the case that of course we're very keen to make sure that we're able to catch up with the. Uh, things like the operations and procedures that haven't been able to be done in the NHS whilst coronavirus has been raging. Uh, we're very, very keen that we end the injustice of uh, long-term social care, where people end up having to sell their homes uh, very unfairly, uh, just because, for example, they have something like dementia, uh, and this leads to huge costs. And we've made the decision uh, that we'll use national insurance as the way to, to do that. Perfectly legitimate arguments about whether you uh, raise taxes or or cut uh, cut spending, those are perfectly legitimate discussions to have. But I'm certainly not going to be discussing the contents of cabinet uh, 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 on the news. That that would be quite wrong. Do you think the rising cost of living should play into this argument? Well, I think the the the, the cost of living arguments are very very real. And as a government, we're we're trying to do everything that we can to. To assist, we know that inflation is high globally. We know that's driven by things like the very high gas prices uh, in the in the wholesale market, for example. Uh, which is why, as a government, we've been uh, doing a lot of different things to assist with things like the winter fuel payments, the the, the assistance to make sure that the cold weather payments and other things are in place, putting up things like the uh, the, the living wage, um, so that it, it still uh, increases, um, you know, at a rate which keeps up with or even exceeds in inflation. So we're trying to do lots of things to help. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think most people recognise the world is waking up from the slumber of coronavirus in this country in particular with its economy, which has been going gangbusters. Uh, the fastest growth in the in the G7 has been uh, reported uh, means that we have particular uh, pressures here to look after. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, thank you very much for your time with us on Breakfast this morning. You're welcome.